going on, everybody? We are back. Episode number 172 of the Club and Sub Podcast. Danny, we are quickly approaching number 200. Life comes at you really, really, yeah, we are. really fast. Yeah, when we started this thing, I was uh, unemployed and watching watching my, at the time, three-month-old every day <laughs> during, during COVID. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, this week, we got UFC uh, Atlantic City. Takes me back to my roots a bit here. Obviously, I'm from North Jersey, but believe it or not, in a galaxy far, far away, a long time ago, I had my hair spiked up, and I was sitting down there at the Jersey Shore pumping my fist with all the uh, all the, all the the guidos out there. Uh, not so much anymore. <laughs> I, I do have do have children now, so so I do no longer go to the Jersey Shore clubs. But we're going back to my roots. I'm going to the event. If you guys will be there, hit me up. I'm going to be chilling with uh, Pepe, John Kelly, our buddy Marcus, a couple other guys from the MMA Twitter scene. But yeah, uh, before we get into this one, which is Aaron Blanchfield, Manon Fioro, guys, if you like the show, drop a like, subscribe. It would help us out. Real quick, let's go through our results from last week. Uh, I'm a bit bitter about this because I lost a unit, and I would have won money if motherfucking Igor Severino did not bite a man's arm (laughs) in the cage. I had a unit to go the distance there. But, yeah, so I lost that one. Had a unit to go the distance there. Not fun. I had the under two and a half in Miles Johns and Cody Gibson. That sucked. I thought Cody would try to force a pace a bit more than he did. Uh, he didn't, obviously. I had Fernando Padilla by submission. That cash for a half unit of plus 600, which was cool. I had Edmund to win inside the distance. Uh, that never looked like it had a chance. I had three units, Muhammad Usman plus 128. Honestly, I did expect some regression after the Collier fight, but I did not expect he was just going to accept just – Jabbing for 15 straight minutes at range. Honestly, the best way to play that fight was goes the distance or over. Uh, I cashed out of my Trey Ogden bet. That felt bad um, because it looked pretty much exactly like I drew it up. And I had Jarno Aarons for a unit and a half at plus 170. That was a great bet. I had 3.8 units at Fernando Padilla. That was a great bet. We both bet Billy Q. Uh, turns out all the narratives around him being shot seem completely accurate. Happens is what it is. Uh, I had two and a half units in Cameron Simon. Terrible bet. Uh, honestly, I underestimated just the, the sheer hardware difference between the two of these guys. And obviously, Simon just too much power, too much durability. He just smoked him, uh, Talbot did. I, I give him credit. He's better than I thought he was. I still think there's some issues with his game, but he's not a guy I'll be looking to fade until he fights, you know, a, a real fighter with like real striking or real grappling. Um, and then I had 2.8 units on Carl Williams minus 175. And yeah, I mean, like I've been saying on the show for years, Justin Topic can't grapple. It's not anything new. We finally saw a guy attempt takedowns against him. So that was good to cash. But yeah, minus a unit on the card last week. Uh, kind of sucked. How did you do, Legs? Yeah, pretty much about the same here. Lost 1.26 units. Had Billy at minus 108. Obviously, that loss had the over two and a half rounds in the Ogden Holobaugh fight. Great bet there at minus 140. Uh, I had the Dobson and Edmund fight to start round three at around Pickham. And honestly, I, I mean, I think it could have been trending toward that way, but it is what it is, really. <laughs> I mean... Unreal. I didn't expect Dobson to come. I mean, he's never come out with that pace in his career, you know? Uh, whatever. And then I had him in those scorecards, minus 115, which pushed. So I don't think that was a bad bet to be. I mean, he's the only one who hurt somebody in that fight. So And he was the only one who I thought would have hurt somebody in that fight. So. Yeah. I pick him up. It's what it is. Yep. This is a cool card. Um, could be better, I guess, name wise, but. I, there's a lot. There's a lot to discuss here. I think, and yeah, we'll get into yeah. it. First fight of the night, Angel Pacheco making his debut off one of the best contender series fights ever. He's taking on Colin Lochran, making his second fight in the UFC off a loss to Taylor Lapolis. Current price: Lochran minus three fifty. Comeback: Pacheco plus two eighty five. What do you think, Kierlegs? 
so like you talked about, there are a lot of fun and interesting fights, I feel like, throughout this card. But in terms of, like, betting spots, personally, I don't think there's a ton. And starting off with this fight here, I feel like this line is probably appropriate, honestly. Like, I, I don't think much of Pacheco. He's much of a – he is pretty much a punching bag standing. I honestly question him making this weight here. He's dropping down to 135 first time in his career. That's pretty interesting. But I, I think this should be an easy spot for Lockren. Yeah, I – um. <sighs> I, I honestly almost laid the chalk uh, on in this fight when it was at minus 300. I didn't because I did see there were some injury rumors about Lochran and some questions about his health. And if I'm going to lay a minus 300, I don't really want to have like any kind of uncertainty in terms of health. But yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, Pacheco, I, I feel like people watch that fight back and they're like, ah, you know, it was such a great fight. It was such a right. war. But High paced like, war, yeah. But, like, Pacheco got hurt, like, seven times in the fight. He couldn't stop a punch. Like, he landed a bunch of strikes, but it's not like it ever seemed particularly impactful. I And I, and honestly, going down to 35, I don't think his durability is going to be that good. I don't think he's that good a grappler, despite having a couple submissions on his record. And Cowlin, like, I bet I bet Lapalus against him in his last fight. But like Taylor Lapalus is like a guy with 20 fights who's got a bunch of great wins, a very good striker with good takedown defense. You know, that seemed like the perfect guy to fade Callen with. Not a dude who can't wrestle and stop strikes with his face. I, I feel like Callen's actually a pretty good prospect. He's a decent wrestler, good jujitsu, very good durability, strong power. I think he's got every edge in this fight and I kind of think he's going to finish it, but again, like with the injury stuff that's in play there, I, I'm not really that I'm not really that eager to get involved. Um, but yeah, yep. Moving on, interesting fight here. We got Andre Petrosky. He's coming off a knockout to Michelle Pereira. He's taking on Jacob Malkoon, the Mamba, the Australian Mamba, <laughs> uh, veteran of the Outback. Current price: Malkoon minus two fifty. Come back on a. Uh, on Petrosky plus 210. I don't know. I, I'm like, there's a part of me that wants to bet just Petrosky just because I, I feel the narrative around Petrosky is he's a jiu-jitsu guy and that's what he is. Except like Petrosky was like a D1 wrestler who also is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. You know, despite his name, he actually comes from a pretty high level wrestling background. And so there's a part of me that's like, I kind of want to take Petrosky here because like pretty much all Jacob Malkoon does is an outside single leg. Now, nobody can stop it, apparently, but that's all the guy does is, is the same outside single over and over. The pause that I have here is I sent uh, Nick Maximoff for a large, large same. bag. And <laughs> now, he did get hurt, but like he looked helpless in there. And Nick Maximoff was also a D1 wrestler with a black belt, and Malkoon just ripped through him. So... I don't know. It, it, it's like, I think Petrosky, he's got the hardware edge. He's got the power edge. He's probably the better jiu-jitsu player. But I don't trust his cardio at all, man. And you know Malcolm's going to bring a pace. Too, really. Yeah. Like, I think this line could be very wide. I have absolutely <laughs> – dude, the chat's actually hopping tonight. I love to see it, guys. Yeah, I love it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm trying to talk. I got my son banging on the window in my office right now. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, the cardio is enough that I just don't really want to get involved here. I do think Petrosky's logically the side. He's a good wrestler. He's got some horsepower. Malkoon, we've seen, can be a bit on the chinny side and isn't the best striker. I lean that direction, but, I mean, Petrosky, he just hasn't done anything that impressive to me, whereas Malkoon going through Brendan Allen is very impressive. <laughs> Uh, Lags, what do you think? You're good. <laughs> so off the, off the wrap, first of all, uh, Petrosky fights. Uh, he hasn't really fought a guy who's going to aggressively wrestle him. I mean, Maximov would have been the only guy who had tried to aggressively wrestle him. And obviously we saw him get subbed in the first round there. Kind of thought, again, that fight extends. I think more often than not, Petrosky probably does get grounded. But I guess, again, massive questions there. Whereas Malkoon, good cardio good single leg like you talked about already I, I mean as soon as this fight got booked honestly I was like Malkoon's just easily just going to keep taking him down this is going to be a massive cardio disparity and a massive rest of disparity disparity down to the stretch and I don't really feel any 
any different coming out of Tate? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the thing is, if you told me Petrosky looked like the hindsight favorite, I wouldn't be terribly surprised, you know? And so it's like, well, maybe you should bet him. The thing is, I feel like Petrosky's upside here is either a quick finish or a close fight where he gasses out down the stretch. Whereas if it just turns out Malkoon's got the best single leg in history, which I don't. <laughs> and so I'm saying a kid nice. randomly walk in the background. Yes, my son randomly stormed into my office and, <laughs> and, just, and just walked behind the TV. That was we, are, we are off to a wild it. start here. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I just think the upside on the Malkoon side is a lot, lot higher. Like I can't. I can't reasonably, even if Petrosky checks every box here, get this past minus 110. Whereas if you tell me Malkoon looks minus 400, I'm not surprised. So I feel like his yeah. upset is that quick finish. Like, I, I don't see a decision really down the stretch. That's me personally, but yeah. I, I agree. I, I agree. So, I mean, that's where I come down. Uh, moving on, though, another interesting fight here. We got a female fight, the first of three female fights, including our main event tonight. We got Melissa yep. Gatto. She's taking on Victoria Dudakova. Current price, Gatto minus 146. The comeback on Dudakova, plus 126. Um, There's a part of me that wants to bet the Gatto side here. Like, I, I think Dudakova is a fairly considerable fraud, personally. Uh, I mean, she's an okay wrestler. I guess she has an okay top game. I don't think she's much of a striker. I don't think she's physically imposing. I felt like we got a lot of answers uh, or a lot of questions answered about Dudikova against Jin Yu Fry in her last fight. Like Fry's not a bad fighter, but if you're if you're a top 20 to 30 fighter in this division, you're not going to a very competitive decision with Jin Yu Fry and Dudikova did. Um the problem for me is the Gato side. Like I think Gato's got the tools to be a very good fighter. Great physicality. She's got decent power for the weight class. Good output on the feet. You know, you could argue she outstruck Ariane Lipsky in their last fight. Lipsky is obviously a very good striker. Dangerous submission grappler. She's an okay offensive wrestler. Um, she's obviously fought a far level, a far better level of competition and beaten far better women. So it's like, why wouldn't I be interested in the minus one forty six? The thing I can't get out of my out of my head is the Tracy Cortez fight. You know, she had every tool to win that fight. And she somehow continued over and over to find herself on bottom. And instead of trying to work up, she does what we see so many black belts do, which was just play guard. And Cortez, reasonably schooled submission grappler, was able to pretty easily float on top and win that decision. And that's kind of my concern here, because I think most of the finishing upside is on the Gato side here, obviously. Um, I think standing, she's the better striker. I think she's probably the better grappler. But, like, Dudikova seems like a relatively schooled submission grappler. So, if she gets two takedowns early in rounds, is that the fight? Like, is she just going to stay on top of her? Right? Like, yeah. like, that's... And, and, like, and, yeah. Like, and like, at my, like, plus 150, I'd be like, okay, I'm willing to, you know, take a swing at this. But at minus 150, someone who could spend like, nine minutes on their back this fight... I just can't get there. I do think Gato's aside. I think she's got decent finishing equity here, but I, I'm not betting Dudikova. What are your thoughts? Or Gato, sorry. What are your thoughts? <laughs> she's got the poly Pollyanna Viana effect. Really? Yeah. She's better than Viana, though, in my oh, opinion. Oh, I know. Oh, 100%. Way more physical and better striker, but the ending up on her back tendency, really. And to me, this is the battle of two frauds. I, I don't think either of these girls are very good. I mean, Dudikova is a one-trick pony with a wrestling, like you touched on. It's pretty much just top game, lay and pray. Not a ton of finishing equity on top. She's no, not much of a striker at all. But yeah, got her laying on her back. It's just a big fear for me here. So it's an easy pass. It, it's too easy to. It's too easy to envision. It, it, it is just way yeah. too easy to envision. You know. So agreed. Uh, moving like, on, we have a very. Sorry, to sorry. To Keep chime, chime in real quick there. Even on Paul, like Pollyanna Viana to bring that up. Like I feel like a lot of people, her versus Reach, who were like, oh, it's an easy fight. Yeah, it's like Reach is just gonna take her down and spend spend on on her back the whole time. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. This is an interesting fight, and it's a rematch. It Another rematch. We've been getting a lot of these recently. But this is like the rematch that we actually need. Like, no offense, I'm all for Molly McCann belt beat up rematches. She made me a lot of money in that fight. Molly sub loved it. I love a lot yeah. of these rematches, but this 
is at, or I should say, I don't love a lot of rematches, but this is one that needs rematch in the UFC, hundred percent. I, I agree, and I'm kind of excited for it. We got Ibo Aslan. He's taking on Anton Turkali. Obviously, Turkali, the pleasure man, best nickname in the game. Only fans guy, apparently. People were saying that in the chat. I, I will take their word I mean, for it. With, with a nickname like that, you kind of have to, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Turkali trying to keep his job. Ibo Aslan trying to start off his UFC career with a win. Current price, Aslan minus 128. Comeback, Turkali plus 108. What are your thoughts here, Legs? Well, first of all, I didn't even think about that narrative. How about that? Torcali's fighting for his job, and Aslan is fighting for his first win in the promotion. How about it? Add more incentive to this this heat. And the guy fight. fighting for his job has won, won the previous yeah, yeah, one. Well, the previous well, iteration say, yeah, of this say, fight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Aslan, who was yep. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be a car crash from the beginning. Like if you walk, obviously <laughs> everybody has watched the first fight. Most of. Um, most of Turkali's success happened after the first couple minutes where Aslan was blowing his watch trying to get him out of there. And he did land some hard strikes there. But I do feel like Aslan probably does KO Turkali here. Like, Turkali's a walking punching bag to me. So I think this fight probably ends violently early. If Aslan doesn't finish him in the first couple minutes again, we could see another sub on the mat. Um, but I like the under one and a half at pretty much near pick him at minus 120. <sighs> I don't hate that. I, I've been considering, uh, I had been, I'm still kind of, like, I'm kind of monitoring the line and, like, considering whether or not to bet Turkali. I, I guess I'm of two minds of the fight, because on the one hand, when you watch the first fight, my feeling is like, like, fuck, Turkali was playing with fire hard there. You know, he couldn't get he him down. Does. Yeah. He, and he, he always plays with fire, yeah. He stops punches with his fucking face, you know, against the guy who hits pretty hard. And it seemed like he couldn't. What's going on, Evan? How are we doing here? Oh, that's not Evan. That's Pepe. What's going on, Pepe? Oh. Um, but it seemed like he was really in, like, dire, dire straits. And then it got out of a round. Aslan was gassed. First takedown. Just toasted. And, and I will say, I don't even care that he was gassed. The way he defended passes against their colleague was like deeply concerning to me. Like he took him down and literally went right to mount. Like one leg stepped right over and him out. Like that shit does not happen in the UFC outside of like the lowest dregs of women's MMA and heavyweight MMA. Like that is where that happens. You know, it, it was alarming to watch. Um, and so I think if your colleague gets him down at any point, there's a reasonable chance He's just going to absolutely fucking maul this guy on the mat. The problem for me is it's not going to be easy to get him down. We saw that in their first fight. I have watched her colleagues wrestling in depth. He does outside of Petrino, which still feels like an out of body performance to me for him. And, and I guess if I thought his durability and his wrestling for the Petrino fight were replicable, I'd be smashing his line here, but we've seen nothing like that in the fight since from Turkali. And like that is really my concern because he doesn't he's a, he's a proactive wrestler, but he's not a very good wrestler. He's got no defense at all. He tanked Petrino's shots pretty well, but obviously, I mean, Pedro just murdered this guy. And given how willing he is to just eat shots on the chin against a guy that hits like Aslan, that's a scary, scary possibility. Um, but with that said, Aslan is more or less KO or bust in this fight. Um I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Probably first four minutes or so, maybe for six minutes. Can you really put that past? Like, like can you get to fifty percent? That feels like a big number to me. You know, can you? Do you think so? It's tough to say because his strength of schedule is so poor that it's like you really. It's hard to just be like, yeah, it's totally fifty percent. But like Anton does block punches with his face. We've touched about this. We've seen it. We see it time and time again. I, I, I just, I, I don't know, man. I, I love it. The thing is, I do think Anton gets knocked out at a very high clip here. But I also feel like it extends and – or he just catches so a kick or something and gets on top and wrecks him at a decent clip. Well, so then hear me out then. Why not just wait and bet him live? You're, you're I going, think that's probably – like, if you like the Turkali side, I would just wait better. Now, I get... Well, maybe for me, like I'm going to be in the arena, and a lot of times the service is all fucked, you know, with all the cell phones in the yeah. arena. I mean, I've been there, yeah. Horrible. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> now, what I will say, though, is even though, like, we're all talking about the live betting, it probably is the better angle, and books might be caught on it. Like, this might be a quick flip 
like within like 30 seconds or even less than that, where it's like, oh shit, he's on bottom and he's passed, boom, and he's finished. Yeah. Yeah, so. that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Um, I lean to Kali, but I think there's a very strong possibility of him getting knocked out very, very quickly here. Yeah. So I'm not like dying to play his side. Uh, moving on. Ooh, this line's moving. This is kind of is interesting. It, is it really? We got Dennis Bazooka. He's taking on Connor Matthews. Current price, Bazooka minus 115. Comeback on Matthews, minus 105. I may end up betting the uh, Bazooka side here. I'm, I've been leaning that I'm way betting. all week. I'm going to be honest. I'm betting Bazooka if the line's coming in like that. I, w- I was looking at it at minus 125, and I'm like, you're telling me minus 115 is probably going to keep coming in? Yeah. Did Connor Matthews I, – I'll say this. I So, like, I, I identified this fight a couple weeks ago as, like, a decent – what I thought was a potentially good buy-down spot on Bazooka because I don't think he's the best fighter ever or even a particularly good fighter by UFC standards, you know. Uh, I think anybody who's watched him fight knows that. But I do think you know, he's obviously very, very durable in spite of how his last fight ended. He boxed somewhat competitively with Sean Woodson, who's had seven inches of or six inches of height and eight inches of reach on him. Um, he's got decent cardio. He's a decent grappler. And it's like he lost to Woodson and Emmers in his two fights. He went to a close decision with Melsick. And now the lines come in and he's near pick with Connor Matthews, where it's like, I'd make Woodson, Melsick, and Emmers all like legitimately like minus 500 or more against Connor Matthews. Uh, and, and, and I guess that's where I come down here because if you watch Matthews' tape, this guy is he's a very inexperienced fighter. He's only got eight pro fights. He's 31 years old. Um, he's from New England, bearish already right there from the get-go. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm kidding. All my roommates in college are from New England. I, I love you guys. Um, but the truth is, the guy to me, he seems like his best asset is toughness. You know, almost all of his wins, other than his last contender series win, came against guys who were like 45 years old or were like 0 and 2, and he was just icing them immediately. Finally, steps in there for the first time with like a mediocre fighter. And what's his name? What's the lightweight? Francis Marshall. By Francis Marshall. And makes Francis Marshall just look like a stud prospect. Like, Marshall is yeah. boxing his face off, landing whatever he wants, easily outgrappling him. Um, and it was telling. Like, this guy is just not very good. He hasn't beaten very good comp. Fights Arias in his last fight. And Arias literally has calves that are, like, smaller than my wrist. Uh, I mean, he just calf kicks him to death. Arias gasses. Kind of just gas pedals him over the course of that fight. Um, but you saw a lot of the same holes were still there. You know, the guy, he did, doesn't move his head, no defense at all, doesn't cut angles very well. He's just got very good cardio, and he's very, very tough. Um, and it kind of concerns me against Bazooka because Bazooka is not very high output at all. You know, he's not going to force a pace on you. He's kind of just going to let you dictate the fight. But with that said, you know, Bazooka's 26. He's from a good gym. He's the much cleaner boxer here. You know, Bazooka actually has some head movement. He moves his head from time to time. He can throw a jab. He can throw in combination. He can kick a bit. He's a strong counter grappler. And that, to me, that's almost the bigger thing is like, I expect Matthews to try and grapple him at times. And I think when he does, Bazooka is going to clown him there like pretty easily. Uh, and so like, I think Bazooka is b- better everywhere. My biggest concern to Bazooka is I don't really trust his cardio hundred percent. And I don't trust his output because he is low output at times. And so Matthews maybe gritting out a very tight split decision seems live to me. But I really think Bazooka's got all the upside here, man. He's a more experienced fighter. He's way younger. He's got way better tools. I think Bazooka should win this fight. Um, I'm considering betting him here. What do you think? So I'm looking up the fight real quick here just to get a name right here. But I went AWMD back is saying, Lags, hold on. We, we might have to pause the stream for a second because AWMD in the chat, he is telling us Bazooka is a lock. A lock. The same this guy might be a full set. Cameron Simon. I, I also Wait. said that. <laughs> fair, fair. Um, so what I was going to say was, I'm, I'm honestly, I watched a lot of fight here, fight tape here for the bazooka side. And going back and watching like the Romero fight to me was super impressive because 
that was fought and he was trying to wrestle him at a pretty high clip and like you touched on i think matthews will try to do that here and, and romero's legit wrestler yes he is and so that gives me a huge huge um plus here for the bazooka side bazooka better striker here you did touch on the volume it is a bit mid so i feel like it could be competitive on the feet but to me matthews just has good kicks good cardio and outside of that there's not much not much upside his strength schedule is absolutely poor you go watch his tape again like you touched on before the marshall fight it's off it, it, it's terrible he it, 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 it it's he's just not a very skilled fighter like he, he's just not yeah. and, you know? and, and not to say that bazooka isn't himself, but I think he's more well-rounded, has the grappling upside here. Bazooka for a small play for me probably is if this line does keep moving. So I, I, I think I think minus 115 is kind of about where I need it to be, to be honest. I wanted like sub 55% because I feel like that kind of I, I can comfortably say I think Bazooka should be minus 130, minus 140 minimum. You know, I, I feel confident about that. So and so on top of that, John, you're gonna add a little uh add a bit, little bit of more percentages there for the uh the home. Home field advantage. You're not wrong. Get Staten him, Island. Him, him, Staten Island, know. stand up. Bazooka's coming out here. He's from Staten Island. AC is only about an hour from Staten Island. Fighting for his job. Home game. Home game. Against job. the New England fighter. People hate New England and New Jersey. As, a Jer- as someone from Jersey. I don't yeah. hate New England. But many people I know. Are not fans of New England from this part of from this part of the world. Um, <laughs> moving on though, we got Julio Arce taking on Herbert Burns. Herbert Burns coming off a couple fucking ugly losses. Julio Arce been on the couch for a minute. Uh, curve price Arce minus four hundred. Come back on Burns plus three hundred. What are your thoughts here, Legs? I think we all know you know the story of Herbert Burns. If this guy doesn't really finish you early, he is prone to gassing and facing the adversity of his opponent. Um, I think the only thing that interests me would be an over, the over one and a half. But again, what gives me pause there is like, we haven't really seen a ton of Arce defensive grappling outside of the Ige fight. So I think Burns could get him down early, but I, I struggle to see him subbing. So I think the over is probably a good look because I don't see Arce finishing in early either. I bet the over, um, and I'll probably bet burn sub one. Honestly, when it, like, so I don't even think ass. we have props on this fight yet. I, I'm pretty we sure. Do, do we? Like eight to Are one. They, it's like eight to one. Yeah, that's not bad. I, I, I mean, I do think it's like reasonably live. I, I feel you're seeing a lot about Arce being a black belt, and it's like I, I've seen multiple people like be like, oh, you know, he only got subbed late by Boom, but it's like Boom only subs people with guillotines. Arce hasn't fought like. A litany of high-level black belts. The best grappler he's no. fought is probably Arosa, right? Yeah, unless you want to say Ige. No, 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 no. I, I mean, Ige, if he gets on top, maybe, but he, the guy can't get on top, you know? Um, like, Bur- Burns actually... I, I actually think Burns is actually reasonably strong when he locks his hands um, and somewhat dynamic in how he moves from position to position. So I do think him subbing... Um, Arce here is live, like very live, much more so than people are saying. Like, dude, Bill Algeo is a better jiu-jitsu player than Julio Arce, like mu- much more so. So is Daniel Pineda. Um, the reason I like over is I feel like the recency bias here is on Burns melt off any pressure at all. But like, yeah. go watch the Pineda Algeo fights. Daniel Pineda is a black belt and he's very physical and he's a very good wrestler. And he was just like, I'm going to fucking tool this guy grappling and just absolutely took it to Burns, like, from basically minute one. He's like, I'm not afraid of grappling exchanges. Grappled with him, got on top, smashed him. Like, the pace Pineda forced on, forced on him, combined with the ground and pound, broke him. Bill Algeo fight. He gets Algeo caught really early in a sub. Apparently, from what he said, now, I don't know if it's true or not, tore his ACL in the first 30 seconds from what he said, though. But he's attacking a sub for about two and a half straight minutes off Algeo. When Algeo gets off him, he doesn't disengage. He's like, no, fuck this. I am going to smash this guy's face into the ground. Proceeds to spend the next two and a half minutes, again, beating the ever-loving shit out of Burns on the ground. Julio Orce is not going to do that. Julio Orce, I enjoy. I love Julio. I bet him a bunch. Very pretty fighter. Very strong counterboxer. But, like, that's his game. Like, Orce is, like, very, very happy to kind of sit back on the outside Let you make your move and play off of you. Like, he is not a guy who's going to go first on people. If you come at him hard, like a guy like Daniel Santos did, 
yeah, he'll let his hands fly and he'll let them fly often if you're going to be aggressive with him. But if you're not going to be aggressive with him and you're going to hang out on the outside, he's kind of cool to do that and just point fight with you. Um, I don't think he's going to be very, very aggressive in ground transitions with Burns if Burns gets it there. I mean, even later in the fight, you know, I saw um, someone mentioned, Dixon Sider mentioned it, KO, Ars KO 2-3. I'm, it could be, but like, I think people forget this, but like a few years back, Herbert Burns went to a decision with Mobley Habalayev. Habalayev is far more dangerous than Arce is um, for anybody who watches PF or who doesn't watch PFL. The dude's an elite wrestler with elite power and is super dynamic. And that fight ended up being more or less a staring contest. And I kind of think that's what we're going to get here. So, like, I bet the burn, um, the over here. I'll take a small poke at the burn sub one, but I might take a small poke on the GTD too, because I honestly think this could go long. Do you have any thoughts on it? Well, I feel like just pointing to his KO 2 3 prop, I feel like a lot of people, like, with these guys who tend to gas like this sometimes just overrate the other guy finishing late where it's like it's all matchup dependent again like bill algeo a guy who's gonna pump volume out i mean that's a very easy in my opinion a late type of finish and I mean, bill's we'll a gangster later. too you know he like is. he he's a violent man like in the cage yes, yes. julio is not <laughs> like he, he will be if you force him to be but he's kind of cool to just you know be yep. the guy who hangs out on the outside yep anyway moving on uh, interesting fight. I, I'm curious to hear your perspective here, Lags. We got Verna John Daroba. She's taking on Lupi Godinez. Current price, Godinez minus 209. Come back on John Daroba, plus 179. you have any thoughts here? I honestly, going through a lot of Verna tape, I hate her optics, man. Her optics standing just bounce up. Like, I, I, I want to hear your thoughts about this, but I, I don't think she's got great cardio. Not that it's bad, but and maybe it's just the optics that it's make not me, good. It's make not me good. Think it's, very yeah, makes me think it's way worse. But to me, like Verna's most of her success comes in that first round. And if she's not winning round one, she basically has to dig those last two rounds out of there because of, because of that cardio. I think honestly, Loopy should be fine here. Much better striker. And I don't think, I don't think she has much threat with the grappling coming back from Verna. Verna could take her down early here, I guess, but I, I don't see her finishing and I don't see her holding her down personally. Dixon Sider said this smells of ends in split. And I, I so I hear, my, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say before I before, yeah. I mean I, I'm with you. I haven't said it too. Verna, I mean, yeah. look at her gas tank in the reboss fight. She was horrible toast in round three. Yep. The only yep. reason she won round three against Angie is because Angie was fucking toast too, you know. Um, but what I'll say is I have a big so I thought I was gonna bet Loopy for sure. Um, pre tape because I am a huge fan of Loopy's game. I think Loopy can compete with almost every woman in the division. She's a very strong wrestler, she's a good boxer, she's obviously a good athlete. Um, I have a lot of concerns after tape, and I don't mean concerns like oh, Verna should be favored, or I'm, I'm not gonna bet Verna because I think Loopy has every tool to neutralize everything Verna does and beat the piss out of her. Like, I, I do. My issue with Loopy is she's just not assertive how she needs to be. Like, she's a great defensive wrestler. I think Verna will struggle to get her down here. If she does, I think Verna could have success. Like, I think she's got a fairly clear edge in jiu-jitsu. Like, pretty significant, to be honest. Um, but I don't think she's going to sub Loopy. But I can see her having success. Um, I just don't, to your point with the cardio, I, I just can't see her having extended success past one or two takedowns. The concern I have is it just seems like, like Loopy, she's not assertive enough. You know, she's not, like if Loop, like I bet Loopy big against Ricci. And I'm like, if Loopy just stays on the front foot, just jabs and throws the occasional two behind it, she's going to beat the shit out of her. But instead she was like super tentative in that fight. She got hurt once. Now granted, it being a split decision was heinous. I thought she won 30 yeah. to 27 personally. But like the fact that it was concerns me. The fact that it was a split with Cynthia Calvillo concerns me. The fact that she was so competitive with Emily Ducote concerns me because she just doesn't separate, you know? And, and that is something that really bothers me because she's not a very lethal finish threat. The times where she's really dominating women, women is grappling. She's probably not going to grapple Verna here. I'd be pretty surprised if she comes out wrestling Verna. Um, I'd be shocked, to be honest, if she comes out wrestling Verna. I don't think that's going to happen. I think she's going to strike with her. 
And she should win that battle very easily. Like, very, very easily. But I, I just, like, if you're like, if you're going to a split decision with 2023 Cynthia Calvillo, I am not going to trust you with Juice against Verna John Daroba. Like, yeah, Calvillo's better, but Verna hits harder than Calvillo does, you know? And Verna's like one slip from getting to a dominant position. So, ultimately, when it comes down to it, I think Lupi deserves to be a moderate favorite here. I think Lupi minus 180 to minus 200 is completely reasonable. She's got better hips. She should be able to defend the takedowns. She's got better cardio. She's a better wrestler. She's a much better boxer. I I just, I I don't like getting behind her with how little finishing upside she really has in this kind of fight. It's just me though. And and I understand playing. That's fair. Yep. Uh, Moving on. Cool fight here. We got, Jamal Emmers, he's taking on Nate the Train Landwehr. Current price, Emmers minus 181. Come back on Nate, plus 156. I really wanted to bet Nate um, before I taped this fight just because, I, I mean, I have a sordid, horrendous history betting on Jamal Emmers. Um, I should have won all those bets. Uh, no, I didn't bet him against the fraud. <laughs> I said Go I was on. thinking about it. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna one out. Wow, do, do you have any doubt that if I bet Jamal Emerson that fight, Dennis Bazooka would have won a split decision? <laughs> like, do you have any any doubt any doubt at all? <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. Even if that fight does extend, I think Emers wins that. Oh time. yeah, I, I mean I, I agree. I don't, I don't even. But think like, it's going to be close to a split. Jamal Emerson shouldn't have a loss in the UFC. Like that, that is, I mean, he got robbed against Giga. He got robbed against Jenkins. Him fumbling the Sabatini bag was just like epic levels of unbelievable. Um, yeah. I, I so yeah, I mean, I want I wanted to bet Nate because Emmer seems to find a way to lose fights. Um, similar to what I just said about Loopy, like the dude, he has every skill to be legitimately like top ten in featherweight. He's a very strong wrestler. He's maybe the best, one of the best two or three defensive grapplers in the sport. Honestly, um, he's a good jujitsu player. He's a good boxer. He just doesn't, again, not assertive enough. He only kind of, he he lets his opponents dictate pace. He almost never wrestles proactively, despite that being probably the best skill that he has. And so he's fighting a guy like Nate, who's going to fucking take it to him, you know? Like Nate, Nate is the epitome of assertive. This guy's going to come forward like a wild man. Um, But after tape, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not laying a big price on Embers for all the reasons I just said. Nate's going to come at him, and if Emmers does his normal bullshit where he's kind of just skirting the outside and only throwing when he needs to, it's going to be a close decision. But I can't get there on Nate because, honestly, Emmers is longer. He's the better athlete by a lot. He's a lot faster. I think he hits a lot harder. I think he's a much better grappler of the two. I, I just don't see a single edge that Nate has in this fight. The only edge Nate has is just pure tenacity and work rate. And I think Emmers has every skill to shut that down here. Um, my concern is just Jamal Emmers doing Jamal Emmers things. But I, I think he should be fine here. I'm a little tempted by over. I'm curious what you think of that and about this fight in general. Yeah, yeah no, I, I actually think the over is not a bad look here. Um, to add on to the advantages, too, I actually think Emmers is more durable, too. Oh, yeah, I mean, by a lot. Yeah. I, to me, honestly, coming out of tape, I'm like, he's going to be the longer guy, faster guy. And honestly, Nate's pretty much a punching guy. He yeah, will force. But... A, he will for, Now he will force a brawl, and this could end up being close. And I do. I was actually just going to mention this. I do think a Nate split decision at like a big plus number wouldn't be a, a bad shot. But I think overs and that small sprinkle would probably be the only way I would look at this fight. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking. I mean, Emmers could knock him out, but I also kind of feel like the over is kind of getting built. Like Emmers getting a first round finish in his last fight is probably coloring the over more than it should be, you know? Because I don't think yeah. Nate's finishing Emmers. I'd be shocked, honestly, if yeah. he finished Emmers. So Agreed. We'll see. Um, moving on, though. I have a strong opinion here. We got Chidi and Jokawani. He's taken on Reese McKee. Well, potentially strong, depending what I'm happens at the way in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, bet, I bet Chidi to win a unit and a half at minus 139. A uh, lot, of, lot of Reese love this week. And... Uh, uh, surface level, I get it. Obviously, you know, Reese, good cardio, high work rate against GD, who's melted a couple times. Um, makes sense why there would be money that came in on him. But man, taping this, I, I just think the skill gap here is gigantic. Like, 
Reese's best skill is not dying and just kind of existing long enough to kill you, but he's not good at anything, you know? His boxing is just kind of wide hooks. He's very slow. He has no defense at all. He's a pretty terrible grappler unless you're tired and you can use his long arms to get like a front choke. He, he's just, he's not a good fighter. He, he's very good for regionals because of his frame and what he does. But for this level, he just doesn't have the athleticism. He doesn't have the defense. He doesn't have the grappling. He doesn't have the striking really. Um, and Chidi on the other side, yeah, he's lost three in a row. But Chidi is a damn good striker who is a very strong athlete, who's very fast, who hits very, very hard. And I think Chidi's recent results, in particular the Rodriguez fight and his last fight with uh, McCall, are kind of coloring people's opinions of him because of how horrible he looked in those fights. But Chidi, people don't realize this, Chidi's 7-2 and two in decisions in his career. Like, this is not a guy with, like, a historically has a bad gas tank. It's a guy who's actually had a pretty good gas tank for most of his career. And he's actually beaten some pretty good fighters by decision. He beat Max Griffin by a decision. So I feel like there's a lot of recency bias playing in here, especially because if you go back and watch the RoboCop fight, he literally almost murders RoboCop about 10 seconds into the fight. The rest of that round is an absolute slugfest, like insane pace. Then you go to the other one, the McCall fight, I mean, he is beating the shit out of McCall, and he gets hurt very, very, very badly. It looked like he quit after it, but he was obviously rocked. Like, I'm not like, oh, he gassed out. It's like, dude went from absolutely piecing him up to being put on skates. And so I think the cardio concerns are massively overblown here. My big concern, and Glimbot just mentioned it in the chat, is Chidi at 170. He hasn't been there. Like, granted, he, ha he does have like 17 or 18 fights at 170 pounds, so it's not like... This is his first rodeo, but he hasn't been there in years. Um, he claimed last time he fought there and he was done fighting there because he was having massive um, physical effects on his insides. Now, Chidi Jokwani, not a doctor. Um, and we hear guys in MMA say this all the time to make excuses about, you know, how shitty they, they look down a weight class. Oh, I'm moving up because my body just couldn't handle it anymore. Not because I've lost three fights in a row and I'm trying to find a narrative right. to, you know, do something else. Uh, I'm not saying that's the case here, but I am saying that happens a fair amount. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a huge concern. Like if Chidi, if this was at 185, I'd have a large bag on Chidi in this fight. I was um, going to say, to chime in real quick, I feel like if this fight was at 185, most people wouldn't have the Reese takes this week. I feel like a lot of the Reese takes are based into the weight cut. That's me personally. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's, that's probably that's true. Honestly, if he misses weight by like four pounds, I'll probably just arm out at a small loss. I'll, yeah, I'll take the loss, fair. like whatever. But I, I also feel like even if he slows down, Reese is so bad on the ground, he can probably just put him on his back and control him there. So, yeah, I mean, I'm on the – and it, by the way, if he looks good on the scales, I'm probably going to add to the position. What do you think, your legs? I think Cheaty tools him early. Like, Cheaty early is just a menace to deal with. I mean, I bet McCall in that last fight. I mean, yes. I was sweating, but I knew and that... McCall's I guess, way better than Reese McKee. Yes, yes way. way, way better. <laughs> and that's another thing, too. Like, even the RoboCop and, like, McCall, we were just talking about. I mean, those guys would both be, like, minus four to 500. Over yes, Reese. against Reese McKee. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, that's I, what again, I'm saying. I'm with you. If he looks good at Wayans, I will add I will add Cheney as well. Because that's really like, what I'm uh, holding off on. One other thing, too, is that I feel like McKee has gotten away with, in large part, being a giant at 170. Like, he's 6'2 with a 78-inch reach. Chidi's 6'3 yeah. with an 80-inch reach. He's never fought someone in his career as big as him. Now he's fighting a guy who's taller, longer, and faster, and just better. Like, like how do you think that goes? Probably not well, you know? Yep. So that, that, that's my guess, anyway. Um, moving on. Interesting fight here. We got Bill Algeo. He's coming in off a victory against Alexander Hernandez uh, that I lost money on. He's taking on Kyle Nelson, who's on a, a bit of a winning streak here. Two-fight winning streak is a big dog off of Blake Builder and Fernando Padilla. Fernando Padilla last weekend. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts here, Lags? Current price, Bill minus 236. Comeback on Nelson plus 201. Honestly, I think like every line here is probably accurately priced. I think the over... Pretty big favorite. I think Bill as a pretty big favorite makes sense to me. I think the pace is going to be pretty massive. I don't think Kyle is going to be able to grapple and enforce some kind of a clinch type of fest here. I think Bill's, again, volume, length. I like Bill a lot here, but 
no interest in laying minus 230, 240 on Bill. He is the other only fans fade. I did see that. Not to mention, real quick, to chime in. I hope not. To chime in, nobody else has mentioned this yet, but Dennis also has an OnlyFans. Someone did mention that earlier, actually. Oh, I didn't see that. It might have been Dixon Sider. I... So I hope that's not true because I have a fucking big bet on Bill he at minus one eighty. Yeah, no, no, not the only that that he's going to lose. He's the only fan. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, But yeah, I bet at minus one eighty. I I priced him about minus two seventy. My view is like kind of what you said. He's taller. He's longer. He's faster. He's the better athlete. He's got way better gas. He's more durable. Um, in my opinion, he's a better grappler. You know, I've seen some people say you know Nelson. You know, maybe his best path is a grapple heavy fight. My own view is if Nelson grapples with Bill, he's going to get badly outgrappled. Uh, people forget, but Matt Sales clowned Kyle Nelson from top position. Matt Sales, one of the worst to ever do it on the ground. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, look, I think, you know, Bill can get hit. There's no doubt about that. And Kyle Nelson packs some heat. So Kyle KOing him early in this fight or maybe janking a decision off a couple huge moments it's a reasonably live outcome. Like that wouldn't shock me, but short of that, I mean, and man, Bill is fucking durable, man. Um, like the pace, like you said, the pace is just, it's so, it favors Bill so much, <laughs> you know, Kyle Nelson, I respect him big time for winning those fights at Builder and Padilla because he completely changed his game. He went from being a guy who was basically just a brawler trying to kill you to like a fairly smart fighter who kind of just played a back foot kicking game the problem is Padilla can't cut the cage and Blake Builder is a fucking trash can. Um, Algeo, he's not going to have problems getting volume off against you trying to back foot. He's going to just fire volume all day long. And I, I just can't see Kyle keeping track of keeping up with it. On top of which, you know, while I think Kyle could potentially KO him early. I actually think Bill is far more likely to KO Kyle than the other way around. I think Bill has got sneaky power. You know, he's hurt a bunch of guys on like sharp counters throughout his career. I don't think Kyle's super durable. Uh, I think the cardio difference is huge here. I think the back end of this fight is going to be especially ugly, but yeah, I mean, look, Kyle's a physical specimen. The guy could knock him out or maybe have a couple moments here, but I I really, it's really hard for me to get past 25 to 30% for Kyle Nelson here. Uh, I like Bill. I kind of like Bill late props here. Maybe even a look at sub two, three, because I really do think if Bill gets on top of him, he's going to absolutely wreck him. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. Moving on. I don't know why this is on the main card. Very bizarre, because I don't think SK Dumas is from New Jersey either. Uh, but we got Nur so. Sultan. No, and nor is he a particularly interesting prospect. We have Nur Sultan Rizaboya taking on Cedricus Dumas. Current price, ooh, some Dumas steam here. Ruza Boya, minus 200. The comeback on Dumas, plus 170. What do you think here, Lags? Well, off the top, again, Dumas steam. I feel like everybody, and I'm, you know, we're going to harp this pretty much every time he fights. Everybody wants a piece of Dumas now, but nobody wanted a piece of Josh Frem. First fight. What are we doing? We did. And we did. We did. So we did. We <laughs> did. Go. But then after this guy goes and beats absolute bum of Cody Brundage, who – which we'll talk about in a few weeks here. He's going to get absolutely sacrificed to Bo Nickel for the absolute, for the quit job that he <laughs> laid on against Malcoon. Penn State stand up. <laughs> and then on top of that, I mean, Isatar, he is, man, he's one of the worst to ever do it. He's horrible gas. He's a big puncher. Ah, that's really about it. And that fight was pretty sweaty. But to me, honestly, I'm just passing this fight because Ruza Boev, I mean, you go through his tape. I think John Martian, shout out him real quick. I, I think he made a great point on this and that I honestly echo completely. Is just His tape is very inco- inconsequential. Like you're going fight to fight and you're like, well, am I really learning anything from this guy? Like what he's doing? He's getting a lot of weird subs, getting taken down. I don't think a lot of his game is replicable, I should say. So I think it's going to be a very interesting fight. I'd rather, I'd, I would lean to the under one and a half if I was going to have any bet on this fight. I, I I don't really have um I I I feel like here's the thing I am as anti Cedric Dumas as it gets I do not see what people are excited about same obviously we bet Fremd against him um I think he's a pretty poor technical striker I think he's a mid grappler and I don't think he's a great athlete 
<laughs> Honestly, despite his dimensions. And he doesn't have great um, pass either. What I will say is, though, the other side of that equation is Nursultan Rizaboyev was like plus, what was he, like plus 250 or plus 200 against um, Bruno Ferreira? Bruno Ferreira. In his first I think fight? it was like 200. Yeah. Yeah. Decent sized dog. We learned nothing from that fight. He literally chinned him on a caught kick and his head, he got knocked out from his head hitting the mat. Um, my priors on the Rizaboyev side were this guy is a sloppy grappler who has a dangerous guard, um, but isn't very good at jujitsu if you get past his guard and his striking is a bit messy. Um, and so with that being the case, it, it's like, I couldn't lay the juice on the Riza Boyev side. You know, I, I, I do think even though I rate Dumas so lowly, I feel like Dumas tripping him and getting the top position or the half guard and just grinding him out is like, not a completely insane thing to happen. Like every take you made about Dumas, I agree with. Yeah, I bet his Itar, and he looked horrible in that fight. But like Ruzaboyev has taught us nothing other than he's a good finisher. Um, but Dumas has taught us that he's that as well. So it's like you have two good finishers. You've got I think Ruzaboyev's game is a bit more developed than Dumas's is. But I, I, I just, it just seems like an extraordinarily high variance fight to me. I lean the Ruzaboyev side just based on his size, athleticism, and kind of being less green than Dumas is. But I can't lay minus two hundred on this guy. I, I'm not even like, like what's right, the John, under? All right, John, I was just saying, what's your take here on the over? Over one and a half because Evan, Evan, if he's still in the chat here, he likes the over at plus money. What do you? I kind of lean the over as well. I, I mean, this is we had everybody, myself included, like a fucking mook. Betting under oh, against, too. with Brundage Dumas. Yeah. Like that could easily happen here. You know, this could be because Dumas, he's not like, despite his regional KOs, he's not a guy who's going to get in the pocket and throw hands, you know, like they're not going to be biting down in the pocket. Dumas wants to kind of sit on the outside and fire kicks. And Rizaboyev wants to just fire big shots. I, I feel like, I, I feel like most of this under is being priced from their pre-UFC days, not based on anything we've seen in the UFC. I lean to the over too, but I don't I don't feel strongly about this either way. Pepe saying Ruse rapes. He could. I, I, I just I, I really just can't get there with like it's like who has he beaten regionally? And you could make the same argument about Cedric Dumas, obviously. Right. But like one of them's plus one seventy, one of them's minus two hundred. Um I, I have more interesting spots that I want to bet here, including this next fight. We got Chris Weidman, the All-American, coming back for one last ride in the oh, Northeast, boy. New Jersey. Home game. Currently sitting plus 205. It's a fucking home game for Weidman. The cup, Bruno Silva, minus 240 here. Um, Bruno Silva has been the bane of my existence for much of his career in the UFC. That he has. Baited him in just about every fight except the mere shark fight. Good times. Bang. Um, but we're going back so to the well here. Real quick, John. He's your, GM3 is your boy. How did you not bet GM3 there? Bro, like, I don't want to get just, into just, it. Just, 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 <laughs> a, fan, just a fandom of GM3. Like, how did you not bet GM3? <laughs> I, I don't want to get into it. Oh, but I am I, I, I like Weidman here. I, I bet him I bet a unit and a half on him at plus two thirty. Look, he's washed. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make the case that he's not washed, you know. I, I do think some of the stuff with his chin is a bit overblown, but he's obviously not durable. I, I, I would say he's fragile, but I also think, like, contextualize the KOs a bit, you know. Flying knee to Yoel Romero. Like, got knocked out in a war with Jacare. It's not like he was just going down to a jab. But he's certainly fragile. Oh, right, and a boy class, though, against a big yep. hitter, you know. Yep. But he, he is fragile, and he's going up against a real hitter here in Bruno Silva. There's no doubt about that. Um the argument I make on the other side of that, though, is that Bruno Silva himself is quite fragile. Um, to your point, the aforementioned GM3 fight, GM3 put him down there. You know, it's, it's officially a sub, but he put him down there with hands first. Um, dude couldn't take shots from Brendan Allen. His gas looks career worse than his last fight uh, against the one-eyed dude. Um, dude was just dead gas seven minutes into the fight. I, Bruno, to me, looks like he's washed as well, um, nor do I think he's particularly durable. And so, like, I'm looking at it, and it's, like, on the feet, 
Look, Bruno is more likely of the two to knock Weidman out in the feet. But, you know, everybody talks about the Tavares fight, how bad Weidman looked. Weidman actually outlanded him in head strikes in that fight. Um, Weidman's boxing looked fine, to be quite honest. He just couldn't deal with the leg kicks. And obviously, Brad Tavares is the best defensive grappler in the division's history. Um, it was a horrible matchup for Chris. Conversely, he's getting priced more or less the same here against a guy who was a truly terrible defensive wrestler. Um, Bruno's only real method to get up is to just give his back up and get right up, which against guys like Andrew Sanchez and Wellington Terman can work fine against a guy with actually a heavy top game and who actually knows how to put hooks in uh, on the back. Like Chris Weidman, who's also a division one all American. It's a little less fine. And so I look at it and I feel, I feel the market forgets how bad Bruno is at wrestling um, and perhaps forgets how good Chris is as it. Now I will say, I think Weidman's athleticism is obviously declining. I don't think, you know, like, Five years ago, I would have said Wyman's like minus 500 in this fight. I don't feel that way anymore because his athleticism is declining as is his durability. I think making Bruno a favorite off of those um, intangibles alone is reasonable. But it's really hard for me to get past Bruno minus 150 here. Like it's very, very possible that if that Wyman hits one takedown, just gets on top and absolutely obliterates this guy on the mat. Like that's a reasonably live outcome. Weidman looking minus 400 in this fight is a live outcome. Whereas there's no way Bruno minute to minute looks minus 400, but zero chance. Um, maybe Weidman just can't take any shots anymore. But for me, it's like the grappling upside alone combined with just the experience edges, the difference in level of comp for their career. I'm happy to go in on Weidman small here. Um, it's not the most confident bet I've ever made, but I, I just feel like stylistically it favors him. Like it's like the best matchup he's had in years. What do you think? Personally, I hope while you're there in attendance that Chris doesn't die. But I, I am of the assumption that Chris is going to die. Go fuck party. yourself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, it's not it's not a hot take by any means, and I, I totally agree with the massive, massive grappling disparity here. But I, man, Chris Weidman. Massive grappling this irony at plus 200 I, in I, this economy. I, in this economy. You're right. You are right. But, man, I hmm, – dude, I bet I bet him against Uriah Hall. I was in attendance. I did, too. I, mean, honestly, I was not in attendance. I mean, yikes. Dude, I haven't bet Weidman that much, believe it or not. Like, I bet Yoel against him. I bet – I bet, um, against Omari. I bet over against Jacare. I bet him. Yeah, I bet him against Omari and I bet him against Hall. Um, yep, same. One and one. But <laughs> but this isn't fucking. I mean, even your who cares about? But this isn't Dominic Reyes. This isn't yeah. you know like this is not Jacare Sousa. Yeah, it, it, it's the line's ridiculous. I I don't even care what what happens. Um, yep, questions will be answered, move, John. Questions will be answered. <laughs> Moving on, we got Vincente Luque taking on Joaquin Buckley, New Mansa. Current price, Luque minus 122. Comeback, plus 102 on Buckley. What are your thoughts here, Lex? I'm going to be honest with you, and I think maybe the Billy Q fight is harboring me a little bit here, but I just feel like we are seeing the regression of Luque in real time to give me just enough pause to where I'm like, I'm fine passing here on this type of spot. I feel like it's largely going to be a close fight that does go the distance, and I actually think the overs would probably be a better look here, if anything. Literally every single person I chat fights with has bet the Buckley side here. A um, lot of sharp people. I, w I wouldn't say this. I, I would not bet the Buckley side. I think it's just a largely close fight. I'd rather I, I mean, I, they they might be right. I I, I, be, I feel yeah. like I feel like I must be missing something, to be quite honest, because like it's like everybody who I respect likes Buckley here. Um, but for me, I can't get there at all. I bet Luke at two and a half units on Luke at minus 110. Um, I and I am like, you know, I'm historically not really a Luke guy at all, but I mean, I'm looking at the fight, and to me, obviously, most of the bets have to do with the trajectory of their career is Buckley being kind of on the come up, Luke on the come down. And I just kind of feel that misses the mark. Like, I'd agree, Luke is not as durable as he once was. There's no doubt. But it's like, if your chin goes from being an A-plus, like the best chin ever, to a B, and that's a huge decline, right? Huge decline yeah. in chin, but it's still a good chin. 
it also is still a better chin than Joaquin Buckley has. Um, just the reality here <laughs> that no, no one's talking about. And that's like the best argument for Buckley in this fight, in my opinion, is Luke's durability is shot. He's declining. Um, in terms of minute winning ability, I know Buckley likes to hang on the outside and avoid strikes like some guys Luke have fought. Jokey Buckley is not Wonder Boy Thompson, though. This guy lost the first round to Andre Fialo two fights ago. He could not separate at all on minutes from him before the KO. This is a guy who was minute competitive with Razak Alassan, went to a split decision with him. Minute competitive with Antonio Arroyo. Yeah, he beat the shit out of Alex Morono. But, like, what has Vincente Luque lined against Alex Morono? You know, as our buddy and friend of the podcast, Sean Orr, said, I love Alex Morono, but he's like a bag of milk. The guy has, like, no physique at all and, like, no athleticism. Um, now he's fighting Luque, and it's like, yeah, Luque has been outmaneuvered by very, very good strikers that manage distance well, but the guy lands volume on everybody. People forget Luque landed 75 significant strikes against Wonderboy. Yeah, he lost the fight comfortably. But Buckley's never landed that many significant strikes in a fight in his career. Uh, I don't think Buckley's going to cruise on minutes at all here. To be honest, if anything, I'd favor Luke on him. I, I know he struggled with southpaws previously, but this is the third straight southpaw he's fighting, which I think is kind of big. And I actually noticed in the RDA fight, he was leading with the two a lot more, leading with body kicks a lot more than he had against Neil or Wonderboy or Edwards previously in his career. Um, I feel... Pepe said Luque has no takedown D, except when he fought Rafael Dos Santos, who's a better grappler than Joaquin Buckley. Um, I, I I just I I really just feel like like I, I think that's probably the best path for Buckley looking like you know, huge to the side is like if he can out grapple Luque, but I don't really see a lot of reason to think Buckley's gonna out even perform anywhere near the level that like a Bilal did against him. Um, I think Luque's the better grappler in the aggregate. I think he's more durable. I think he's as dangerous, if not more so. He throws in combination better. Luke can counter, and Buckley's pretty susceptible to the counter coming in. Luke's fought the better competition. I I, I mean, like, like Joaquin Buckley's best win is Impa Kasangadai like four years ago or three years ago. I, I, I'm just like, to get to this angle on Buckley, you've got to think Luke is basically just done in MMA, in my opinion. Um, short of that, I don't. There's a lot of questions about Luke, but how do you get sub minus 150? You can't possibly think Luke Buckley's more likely to finish Luke than the other way around. Pre-fight anyway. It may look that way post-fight, but like Jeff Neal, I know Neal finished him, but Neal was sitting there firing combinations in the pocket. Buckley doesn't want to hang in the pocket. He wants to throw one or two shots and get out. Um, historically, Luke is the higher volume fighter. Historically, Luke is the more dangerous fighter of the two. One of them has been fighting only top 10 guys, and one of them just beat Alex Morono. I mean, to me, the questions around Luque are enough to say, okay, you can't go past minus 150 here. But I certainly don't see how you can go below minus 150 here, in my opinion. Um, so we'll see. I could be way off with, with this, my read of the fight. I, I know plenty of smart people who completely disagree, but I'm on the Luque side here. Um, we'll see what happens. Hey, last thing Whoop. to add, though, too, John. Luque. Home field. You're going to say it again? That is true. Vincente Luque, <laughs> native of Westwood, New Jersey, about 10 minutes from where I grew up. A surprisingly wealthy area, believe it or not. Uh, oh. For a guy who moved back to Brazil and played some mixed martial arts for a living. Uh, but yeah, it's a home game for Luque. People forget this. One guy's from Detroit, one is from New Jersey. He's making his home coming here. We're going to get, well, I was going to say we're going to get the Diddy coming home montage here, but oh, maybe cool. not. Maybe not maybe after not. yesterday. That plane might have shipped, might have shipped off, John. I, I, I was in the, uh, I, I was in the gym today and coming home hit on like my gym mix. And I was just like, man, this song slaps, but like, should I really How ironic. be listening to it? Yeah. <laughs> How ironic. It's like, oh. Uh, but yeah, moving on. Before we get to the main event, though, we are gonna do a quick little, 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 little act here. Uh, another little segment. I was thinking about it the other day because my wife had it on. I don't know, lags might be, might be. You might be too young for it. Are you familiar with Xeno Warrior Princess? Okay, 
All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pass on the segment then. We're gonna pass sorry, the segment. John. I'll set you, I'll sorry, set John. you up for it. Uh, I was gonna say which one of these women is more likely to be Xena Warrior Princess in a reboot, since she is kind of like a grungy hot chick. But yeah, well, <laughs> we're just gonna go with who's hotter here. Who 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 Ooh. in your opinion? That's easy. Come on. Even if well, who would you rather kid. who would you rather sleep with though? I'm sorry. Yeah, Actually, same. Is, is I, 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 I was, I, I was hoping you'd throw me something interesting, like you know, ugly chicks occasionally, you know, end up mixing, mixing it up a little bit better. And the, but, all right, all right. No, no, no. And on top of that, <laughs> I'm gonna give. I'll, I'll start it off here, John. I have a passion to take here on the Blanchfield side at minus one fifty five to win a unit. All right, and a half. here we go. To win a unit and a half. And now, I don't think the takedowns are gonna come easy here. I completely understand that but i do think that her type of game her consistent pressure her consistent pace i do think she can find top position here i think manone struggles with that pressure when she's brought to her hey it is what it is. hey it is what it is i am confirmed for look at this look at this but yes and listen no doubt manone better striker here i just kind of disagree with the takes that she's just gonna piece her up for large portions of i think aaron's going to be competitive on the feet but largely, I just think she can get the takedowns and will get the takedowns here the larger this fight goes. I think she's got more proven cardio, and I think a lot of the questions are on the Manone side. With the cardio in a pressure-heavy fight, with the cardio, the best, or I should say, with the grappling, the best grappler that she's fought, I like Aaron here. Yeah, I came, like, very, very close to... Well, before I get into it, I will say, since there are people in the chat who do get Zeta Warrior Princess... Sorry. I'm going to say... Well, it's kind of like now since you didn't have an opinion, it well, kind of like say, ruins the entire it, bit. I would, I would, I would pick Aaron just because you know you need a little bit of the sex appeal, which Manone lacks. What I was going to say prior to that about who would you rather sleep with? Every once in a while, you find an ugly chick that can just mix it up better than everybody else. You know, you never really know. And Aaron's Aaron seems very about that MMA life. You know, how much time is she really spending? You know, under the covers. No one really knows. Although the picture that I, I posted for this podcast looks pretty good. True. Hey, <laughs> spends a lot, spend, hey, John spends a lot of time grappling. She does spend a lot of time grappling. Versus, very wooden, me. versus very wooden striker. A little bit older, getting up there in age. Eh, come on, John. It's easy. Uh, you're, fair enough. Anyway, I, I tried to make, I tried to spice it up a little bit oh, there, but okay. I think that kind of, I don't think that went that well. Um, we'll try to bring it better, make it, bring it better next time. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway though i yeah i thought about betting manone here just because i do think the physicality is um potentially concerning for aaron uh, obviously you know she kind of struggled <laughs> bro we got two straight women, women female right. main events man right. i i don't john, know what you're going to do with it hey, john instead instead of us talking about the uh talking about the xena word francis how about this better nicknames between the two we have Manone, the Beast, Furo. That's and you horrible. Got Aaron, cold blooded Blanchard. Yeah, I mean, cold, cold, not, I, cold blooded is like that's like one of the best. Anyway, I anyway, know. anyway. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I'm like that. I, I, I'm the thing is, so like Tyla gave her a ton of issues with physicality. I think Manone theoretically can too, because I don't think I don't think Aaron's wrestling is bad, but I think it's very, very average. Obviously, when she gets the top position. Um, She's elite. It kind of reminds me to a, a bit, to a degree of like Aljo a bit in like her wrestling. Whereas like Aljo is not a great wrestler, but if he gets on top of you, he's going to absolutely wreck you. Um, the big difference between her and someone like Aljo though, is the tenacity. And so Manone looks very physical to me. She looks very strong, but it's kind of hard to evaluate her takedown defense. Cause you look at the majority of takedowns she's defended in there. Victoria Leonardo, Jennifer Maya and um, Rose Nami. Rose. I, I'm very sure Aaron's a better wrestler than all of them. So first of all, Manone's TDD didn't look bad against any of them, but it, 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 it's not, I, it doesn't tell me much in the context of this fight. Plus I got a little nervous watching the Rose fight. She like, she, she doesn't really, I'm trying to think the best way to describe it. So everybody understands it. Like when you're defending a double leg, you want to be down blocking hard into a sprawl. Like you want basically your legs all the way out, the majority of your weight on your chest. She doesn't really seem to do that well. Um, her reactions are good, which helps. 
But something I noticed with Aaron is like Aaron will reshoot a lot of times. Like if her double gets stopped, she just fires it again immediately. And against someone who is not getting that kind of like strength behind them, like Manone, it becomes very easy to get in on her hip, on your on their hips. So like I have this suspicion that takedowns are, despite Manone's physicality and strength, takedowns are going to come a bit easier here than they did against Tyler Santos. Um, in terms of Manone on bottom, she looks capable. Like she's got a very strong wizard, and I think if she gets a wizard on Aaron, Aaron won't hold her down. She'll get right back up. Because she seems to be a pretty capable gra grappler. She's a black belt. We don't really know what it looks like if she doesn't have that, though. The only the only data we really have um, of her without a wizard in is years ago against Leah McCourt, and it looked pretty awful. So I kind of lean, think Blanchfield is going to have a decent amount of grappling success in this fight. Um, with that said, Manone obviously is the much, much, much better striker here. I think she's going to win the striking fairly easily, at least early while she's fresh, just because she manages distance better. They're in a big cage. She's got good movement. Uh, but even there, I had some concerns because she throws so many stupid fucking kicks, like these like reverse hook kicks and these lead leg kicks that are just so easy to put her down with. And I'm not sure with her style that she's got the capability to kind of fight outside of her style. Um, and then, of course, you go with the cardio. Aaron pushed a fucking hellacious pace against Tyla, and we just kept coming. Now, I did think she was slowing down at the end of that fight, but it didn't stop her from continuing to come up to, to, to continue to push it against Tyla. Whereas Manone was kind of getting walked down late against Rose, who doesn't have great cardio. And so, like, I think about this fight, and like, my instinct is the line is a tad wide, just because I do think. It's within the realm of possible outcomes that Manone is strong enough and physical enough to rebuff enough of Aaron's takedowns and or just get up and outstrike her here. Um, but with the uncertainty around the grappling, you have to make Aaron fave. And then when you factor in the cardio and just her tenacious and relentless nature, I kind of feel like it's like even if Manone answers every question as yes, she can do this, it's like I still have to favor Aaron here. And if the answer is no, like let's say she's bad without a wizard in or doesn't have the cardio to fight the pace Blanche pushes, she could theoretically look minus 300 Blanchefield, I mean, or minus 400. And so plus you have Manone coming from France and obviously they're fighting in Aaron's backyard here. Um, yeah, I just think all the upside at the price, not at the price. I'm not, I, I would not bet Blanchefield here. I like, I, I, but I'm saying, I think personally, I know you did. I, yeah. I, just I, I mean, I, per I personally think even where the line's at now, because another point to add on, I think she has all the finishing upside here. Like, where, yeah. when you were just, we were talking about there, even the line upside, like, where is Manon looking like a massive fate? She, in my opinion, has no finishing upside here. I don't think she's blowing away rounds on the feet, given the type of tenacity that I expect yeah. from Aaron. So I expect it to be a close fight, even if it does end up going 25. And she does set, check some boxes in the grappling. So, Yeah, I agree. So like, that's my point. Is like I would have a hard time imagining Manone being much past Pickham, whereas I wouldn't have a hard time imagining Aaron looking like a large favorite here. So, I mean, it's a pass for me. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's a cool card. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be down there. I'm going to be hanging out with Pepe, Evan D, John Kelly, all the fight numbers, I'm so boys. Jealous. I'm jealous. Dude, you're the one who's, got, who's going fucking home to mommy and daddy for fucking e Easter. Easter. Easter with the girlfriend. Bringing her home. Bro, I, I'm driving. I am driving at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning from Atlantic City to fucking Long Island and meet my family at my in-laws house. All right. Sacrifices are being made here. <laughs> that, 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 that's it what been, it's all about. If, if I would have went there Saturday night have to drive back Sunday. Like, it's a long drive for me Sunday from long, from AC all the way to Pittsburgh. Oh, that's probably like eight hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's probably not so, fun. I mean, I couldn't, I would love to do both <laughs> if I could, but yeah. Pepe saying fight numbers promo code AC for 10% off. There you go, people. Use it. The fight numbers promo code. Um, great guys over there. John yeah. Kelly running a tight ship. Some super sharp dudes there. And, yeah, guys, if you're in the arena, hit me up. Or you're hanging out in Caesars, losing some money and want to have a drink. Or lose money with us. Hit me up. Uh, we'll see you Saturday. Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. Uh, we'll be back next week, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern. Please, 200 people watching. 
Drop a like, subscribe. We would appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Good luck on your bets this weekend, people. Peace.